So here we are, another Sunday of Advent, the third Sunday of Advent, and it seems like Christmas is here already. I know. The whole year has gone by, it seems like, in just a split second. It seems like we were just saying to each other, or saying to each other, Happy New Year, and now we're ready to say it all over again. Today I want to lift up from uh, the Philippians passage this thought for to guide our sermonic moment. Still got joy. All right, now. I know it's grammatically incorrect because you want to hear still have joy. But down in South Carolina, where I'm from, the low country, ain't nothing correct about our English. <laughs> so we still got joy. It's an exclamation that we've heard time and time again. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. But why? Today's epistle passage is an intriguing composition of seven sentences ranging from two to 20 Greek words long. The sentences have no connecting words except but, or ala in Greek, and kai, which is and in Greek. As I said, very intriguing series of exhortations. The twofold expression of rejoice echoes from the apostle in chapter 3, verse 1, where he says the same thing. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord always. Seems to be rejoicing is the keynote of this particular letter, the statement that calls for ongoing activity. It is the rejoicing that offers us that something must happen. Maybe Paul had a glimpse that our rejoicing was going to have to continue because there would be future, present, past trials that we would must rejoice even in the midst of. The idea then is to keep on rejoicing the Lord at all times, regardless of what may come upon you. At this point, it's important to remember that Paul is in prison. For one of the many times he's been in prison for preaching and spreading the gospel, and how strange of Paul once again to say rejoice from a prison cell. As I read the whole passage of scripture, rather the whole book of Philippians, I found out that Paul was so intrigued with being in prison, but he was excited even then to have joy while in prison. Because at that, period, at that moment in his ministry, he realized that the gospel was still being preached, even in jail. He said some are preaching with sincere hearts and some are preaching with contrite hearts, but the, matter, the, the, only, the only important thing is that they're preaching the gospel. And the gospel is that Christ came, Christ was born, Christ lived, Christ died, but Christ rose with resurrection power. It doesn't matter whether you're a pure heart saying it or a heart that's contrite saying it. Just say it. Rejoice, Rejoice. in the Lord always. It's interesting that Paul is even excited that those who are naysayers around him are still preaching the gospel. I don't even think they realize. Have you ever been around someone who's so negative that after a while your positivity rubs off on them and they start speaking positive and they don't realize they're speaking positively? <laughs> but everyone else in the room has noticed a shift or a shift in, in their language, a shift in their demeanor or body language. It's the same kind of thing that even when adversity faces us, when adversity is around us, even adversity at some point will have to say, rejoice. Because trouble don't last. Always. <laughs> That's a song that Timothy Wright made popular back in the 80s. And then further, the Apostle Paul teaches us to demonstrate, and he even demonstrates to the congregations that he started, that you can rejoice in adversity. Paul would most likely see himself as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Even in prison, where most of us would think there'd be a lot of depression and depravity, Paul still finds a reason to rejoice. Even in prison, Paul is able to preach the gospel. What have you done in your moments of prison-like experiences? Have you wallowed in the seemingly uh, uh, depressing state that it might be? Or have you found a reason to have joy? Maybe that reason is simply that you breathe in and breathe out. That's reason enough to have joy, don't you think? Maybe it's that you have food, clothing, and shelter. That's reason enough to have joy. Maybe it's that you're in your right mind, or maybe it's that you are. all of your needs are met. You're not lacking in any area of your life. That's a reason enough to have joy. 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 God's great joy. 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 Down in my soul. Sweet, beautiful, soul-saving joy. Joy. 
in my soul. I've got joy like a river. I've got joy like a river. I've got joy like a river in my soul. I've got joy like a river. I've got joy like a river. I've got joy like a river in my soul. Things like people protesting in mosques all over the country and people uh, uh, blaming Muslims for the shooting, all Muslims for the shootings in San Bernardino. Things like the uprisings of confusion on college campuses and things like HIV and AIDS on a rampant high in our communities. Things that would call us to not have joy create a joy experience for me because I know that God is working behind the scenes. Yes. Yes, because our joy is not founded in the happenings of our life, but rather the one who orchestrates life, the one who is working behind the scenes to repair systemic sin. Yes, we can rejoice whatever be tied, because God will take care of us. Amen. The key to understanding Paul's exhortation to rejoice is that it is in the Lord. This signifies that the Lord is either the object of our rejoicing or its grounding. I would suggest that the Lord is both the grounding of our rejoicing and the object of our rejoicing. Uh, This continuous rejoicing in the Lord is a very important concept for Paul. Paul says this to every community he writes to in some way, shape, or form. He tells them to rejoice, be it whether you are going through, whether you're doing well, in season and out of season, rejoice. It's a part of his greeting or his closing to every letter that he's written in the New Testament. Paul did a whole lot of rejoicing. So why are you complaining? Paul did a whole lot of rejoicing. So why are you saddened? Paul did a whole lot of rejoicing. So why are you beside yourself? Guess I don't get an answer there. It's still a fruit of the Spirit, joy. It becomes evident during the times of trial and suffering. In the short sentence of this particular epistle, Paul offers us the word gentleness, which seems almost, it's really tricky to translate the word gentleness in Greek because it's what we think it says. It's a true transliteration, a mental interpretation of what the original languages say. But the language includes it as what is fitting. Rejoice and be glad exceedingly because that's fitting. Magnanimity and reasonable. It is also can be understood as a way of describing the clemency of a ruler. Undoubtedly, the Philippians live in a context in which they are purported as a benevolence nation under the Roman Empire. If the Christian life were to be characterized by joy in that time, you wouldn't find much. Because the Christians were being persecuted for starting communities, much like what we might look like today. Could you imagine if, if the White House or the government or the city or the mayor t- came in the, came in the uh, door there and said, this is not going to happen. I'm taking your joy and I'm putting you in prison. Would you then find a reason to have joy? Would you spread the gospel in in prison? Mm -hmm. Would you do it in a way that involves you giving of yourself, sharing your testimony in a way that people are changed and lives are healed and our communities are made better because you have a little joy? But what happens when our communities are like that of the Philippines? The Church of Philippi resides in a context that is much like what I described two weeks ago when I preached, that is full of, uh, of arguing and war. There's a, there's a grave disparity in the country and the nations of the Roman Empire because we have a Roman emperor who should be the god you worship. But oh my goodness, these people have found a new religion, one that allows them to freely and, and boldly approach the throne of grace and seek mercy and grace in the time of need. And that creates a great schism. A schism that does not allow for a smooth ending, so to speak, as we look at the biblical canon. If you've been in our Wednesday sessions, uh, spirituality and, and sexuality, we've encountered some of the schism and dealt with some of the stuff that creates uh, contingency within the Bible. Uh, the stuff that, uh, that separates us, so to speak. The stuff that keeps us confused and bewildered. It's interesting that we as human beings, and I bet Paul would say the same thing, that we as human beings make mountains out of molehills. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and all God says is rejoice. But we would make that into, we would have a meeting about a meeting about a meeting about how to rejoice. <laughs> and all Paul says is rejoice. Rejoice and have, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. 
For this is your hope. Rejoice. Your joy is wrapped up in some stuff that if you can get beyond your mental capability, get beyond the stuff that would try to beset you and just look to the hills because joy Amen. is nigh. All right. Just like victory a few weeks ago, joy is nigh too because our joy is wrapped up in a, what I like to call six pound, three ounce baby Jesus. Right. <laughs> I can imagine he probably weighed that in the manger. He laid in a king size bread bringing, bed bringing joy to all the world. But what if that joy wasn't enough? What if there's still confusion about what joy really is? Three questions I want us to consider. The first one is, I'll tell you in just a moment. Don't <laughs> the first question, what does it mean to say I still got joy? I said it a few moments ago, grammatically it doesn't work. But I like to say I still got joy. Many years ago, there was a campaign that was started about 1993 or so where you saw all these people coming around with got milk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and what the, the, the basis behind the campaign was making an awareness for the importance of calcium and, and bone structure and as a, as a way of helping, especially women, deal with osteoporosis mm -hmm. or the loss of bone density. And so the Got Milk slogan began to be adapted by different people and different organizations. So you found people saying things like, uh, got hope. Mm -hmm. Then the church tagged on and said, got Jesus. Mm -hmm. Got this or got that. We began to see the tag everywhere. But the simple question implied, got milk implied that there was a need for milk for your lively, for your sustainability. Amen. And so I ask you the question, got joy? Yes. It's, you you kind of need joy amidst what's happening around us. Because it's got a real strange way of making you feel bad. If you just look at what's happening, you can't find joy. So it's something that you must consciously, as the apostle says, you must consciously make yourself do or be or am. You got to have joy that the world didn't give and the world can't take it away. But the second question is, what influences your joy? Is your joy only contingent upon everything going your way? And if things don't go your way, you stomp out of the meeting, or you run out of the building, or you let all loose because it didn't go your way? If so, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. Your joy won't last all long. Otherwise, is your joy contingent upon how you feel today, or how you don't feel today? Does your body ache today, or does your body not ache today? Is your joy contingent upon, do I have a job or no job? Does your joy content, is, is your joy contingent upon, is there a, a filet mignon on the table, or do I have a meal made for me? Is your joy contingent upon the things that you think you need and deserve in life, or is your joy based upon, I have every need met? Everything that I can imagine, God has blessed me with. Yes. Because I have an abundance of love, I have an abundance of hope, I have an abundance of peace, but most importantly, I have an abundance of joy. What influences your joy? But then lastly, I recall as I read through the selected curriculum before today that God is working behind the scenes. Yeah. It's in verse 7. It's in verse 7. It says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The fact that there is peace means that it is a direct result of joy. Look at the passage of Scripture. The entire book talks about joy. And when you've got joy, you will have peace. Mm -hmm. Peace that flows. Peace that surpasses. Mm -hmm. When we rejoice in all things, we find that peace is present. When you say, I still got joy, you can smile in the face of sadness. Mm -hmm. When you say, I still got joy, you can rest assured that God is for you. Mm -hmm. And that's more than the whole world against you. Mm -hmm. When you still got joy... You can stand in the midst of hard trial and circumcision. When you've got joy, you can stand when you're standing by yourself. When you've got joy, you know that there's no one or nothing that can take the joy that you've got. This joy I have, the world didn't give it to me. Oh, this joy I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy I have, the world didn't give it to me. The 
world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. Oh, this joy I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy I have, the world didn't give it to me. Oh, this joy I have, the world didn't give it to me. Oh, the world didn't give it and the world can take it away. I still got it.